Hello and welcome to Apple with the Doc. Today we'll be talking about a new discovery in the field of neuroscience. A quite a game-changing discovery, I would say myself. And it has to deal with the way you're thinking. Um, so before we jump into it, and before we get started, uh, for those of you who are new um, to the podcast, let me explain about a little bit about what I do. Um, every podcast goes into a new topic or a new field of um, intelligence or um, a new discoveries within the field of uh, medicine. I am a doctor who I just give my analysis and how that might affect you. Um, so hopefully I can help you learn. Hopefully you can um, find a way to make a, your decisions in medicine a lot better. Uh, but yeah, let's jump into it. this new discovery that's um, currently uh, developed it's it has to deal with how our brain thinks these certain uh, pathways that are involved um, originally we used to think that okay I'll stop teasing you uh, if you read it you probably if you read the title you probably know uh, the cerebellum is actually um, finding out to be uh, more and more important for your thought process so you we used to think that it's mainly dealing with the uh the brain or the frontal cortex area um that's where you you're said to live so you're said to um have your personality uh now we're trying now we're slowly figure out that the cerebellum is what's um actually helping with the quality control um the cerebellum actually helps with uh, other things it's also meant there for uh, stability it controls your uh, movements not exactly controls it but it uh, helps regulate your movement so that your movements are slow so let's say if you're to stick your hand out and you want to raise your hand to ask a question or something in your classes or you wanted to use your both of your hands to hit a baseball your cerebellum would be there to help regulate other signals coming in so that you you can actually raise your hand properly or you can actually hit the ball properly. Uh, your cerebellum is what I would call a filter. I can exemplify this if you think about uh, Parkinson's. If you look at a person with Parkinson's, you see that they're shaky. They can't really control their movements well. So if you wanted to raise your hand, Instead of raising it sideways, you may want to raise it forward. Um, the cerebellum would say, okay, let me stop the signal that says I w want to use the uh, the mid-delts, or the mid-deltoids instead. I want to use more of the anterior deltoids. Um, that sort of stuff. Um, thinking how uh, the cerebellum has um, an effect, it's been around for a while. It's been postulated. They've done um, studies uh, like meta-analysis, that where they but they couldn't exactly prove it observationally. Um, if you look back, you can see that there's like studies on um, cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome, where they use uh, they study the behavioral patterns of those who actually suffer from spinal ataxia. Um, so it's like these people would have what happened. They would have uh, more of like a depression, anxiety, that sort of stuff, um, along with like the inability to um, control them, like fully control their movements. Uh, especially like if you think about those who have uh, cerebellar um, ataxia. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so those people who are like born who can't really control their um, walking patterns, you often see them walking with like these sort of crutches that go around their forearms. Um, that's how I would 
explain that. Now, this study, how this came about, is quite remarkable. Um, this goes from to University of uh, Texas in Austin, where they have this group of people, um, about 10 or so, who would scan themselves in the MRI machine every night. Now, you may be thinking, oh, what about all the radiation exposure? There's very little radiation involved with um, MRIs compared to a, something like an X-ray or a CT, a computer tomography scan or CAT scan. Um, it's it has to deal with like the magnetic force that happens with uh, atoms. So let's say that um, you're back in physics class. It's in the section where you deal with magnetism. The basics of magnetism deal with a charged particle. Movement of any charged particle creates a magnetic force around that particle. Um, so if the electrons that ha that um, in an atom these are negatively charged um, particles, I would say. Um, and so these move, their movements actually create a magnetic force, a very weak, 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 like you won't be able to feel it. Your magnet won't be able to pick it up. Um, but unless you have like a special sensor. And so it's relatively harmless. Um, you do have to deal with the incredible amount of noise that the machine generates. You do have to deal with just sitting there for about 30 minutes. And that's what these people did. Um, they found out that their their hospital that they're working at uh, allows for a discount of the MRI machine after midnight. Uh, so it's a it was like a ninety percent discount. Uh, so you might want to think, okay, if I need the MRI, just go to a hospital after midnight, I guess. Um, but this also brings in the question: Why are the prices so jacked up and high in the hospital? If you want like an MRI, why can't you actually get it? And so. Um, that's probably a topic for a different time as to why healthcare costs so much. Um, and it has to deal with like the actual insurance companies and it has to actually deal with um, how things are being charged and legislation that's in, currently in place. Um, so anyways, what this um, group of 10 people did, um, they sat in the MRI machine every night and it was a functional MRI machine and where they just thought about nothing or they just sat there idly or a resting functional MRI. Now a functional MRI, um, it incorporates the anatomy like a regular MRI, but it also incorporates uh, the oxygen delivery, the blood flow in the area. So an area that has a higher amount of blood flow indicates that it's actually being used a lot more. So let's say um, you're trying to like move your arm the sulcus that has the uh, movements you'll see that light up a lot more um, let's say if you're like um, sticking your finger like someone's poking your finger uh, that area will light up more and that's how they're able to uh, deduce like what's part certain parts of your brain and how they light up based on this functional MRI and so they were able to find that and so when they actually did the scans they were able to see um, the blood flow that goes from like the frontal cortex, um, that area lit, lit up, and then a few milliseconds later, uh, they were say, they were saying several hundred, sorry, several hundred milliseconds later, the cerebellum will light up, and they would think that this is something that has to deal with the actual um, quality control, the uh, filtering of like the signals, just to make sure that um, the brain or every all the thoughts were. Um, done correctly so this also has to deal with like uh, quite a bit of um, science that can actually be implemented so if I were to say that whether or not this study was good or not I would say it's amazing because then you start to think about a little bit about schizophrenics and other uh, neurological um, issues so let's say if someone who has delusional thoughts or someone who has uh, voices in their um, heads they can't think properly, like a schizophrenic. Um, one thing I would say is you would try to have, um, you, you you could look up how Anderson Cooper um, from CNN actually tried to live as a schizophrenic. That video is actually pretty interesting, uh, given that it's from CNN. But 
uh, you can hear, you can see that how like frustrated he was. What he would do is wear earbuds in his ear and have voices constantly talking. I mean, he can't really take these earbuds out. That's similar to how schizophrenics would feel. Uh, they have these voices in their head. They can't control their thoughts uh, properly. Now, maybe that has something to do with the cerebellum. Um, only time will tell. But this does call into question um, whether or not like the cerebellum plays a bigger role in thought process and not just movement process. So, uh, but yeah, this is something that's like a new and amazing study that's out there. But uh, thank you for listening. This has been Apple with the Doc. Uh, hopefully you continue to listen. Uh, if you have any concerns or topics or want to tell me where I can improve, you can always reach me out on Twitter at djacknoff. Thank you for listening.